absolutely not. I do not give advice. Uh, to just anybody. And you want to know why I don't give advice to just anybody? Because I have a lot of haters. Now I know everybody says they have a lot of haters. Like you can't be a rapper without haters and you can't be on the internet without haters. Like it's like, a, it's like now like a status symbol, but no, I've got legit haters. I've got a list. I could show it to you. And my thing about giving advice about how I run my business, which thank you very much is a very successful business, is I ain't giving tips to haters. I ain't casting pearls before that swine. Uh, so if you wanted to hate follow me around the internet and try to figure out what I'm doing, uh, you would need to buy a book. I'm gonna make you spend money. That's always been my thing. I'm petty that way. Uh, but on the strength of how much I've loved this series and that it has featured some of my favorite people, uh, <laughs> I'm speaking in public about how I work. <laughs>
Like I just hear things differently. <laughs> um, and that perspective, the way you are shaping the world as a creative person with everything you do, that's your voice. That's your voice. I think you gotta create something, an experience for people. Um, not just the argument you wanna fire off, cause like that's self-serving, right? That's you, you wanna speechify, right? You wanna be a pastor. You just wanna talk and have people hear you, like that's different. Um, when you're a writer, you gotta get people to buy in. You can't just sit up there and write a sermon, right? You gotta give them an experience of the thing you are writing and you're creating that will hold them even when learning gets real uncomfortable. And learning something new is uncomfortable all the time. Like we try to make it sound like it is easy, but you ever seen like a two year old, your kid enc encounter something for the first time and like they fall out on the floor and have a temper tantrum? Because it's hard, it is hard learning things. It's just that as we get older, we're not allowed to fall out on the floor anymore. So instead we act out in other ways, <laughs> but learning is hard. So you got to give people something. And what I think I give them when I'm writing, fuck that. I know what I give them. I give people the experience of my confidence of knowing what I know. And people love to feel confident. People love to have a, a way to look at the world that solves something, right? And until they figure it out for themselves, they are vicariously living that through the experience I create for them. I say to them, listen, in this book, in this essay, I'm gonna put up some guardrails for you. And I have figured out some of the tough stuff and um, I've got the bumper rails for you. I know which ones you need and I know when it's safe for you to break out and run free and I got you. When I convince them that I got them, I can take them on the rest of a journey that they may not have wanted to take. A journey where like you questioning everything you believe in your life. Like, you know, you ain't sign up for that on a Tuesday, but I'm gonna take you there. Cause I told you, I got you. I got you in this piece of writing. I got you um, in this community. I have to build that trust every single time I go up to bat, every single time. And that means when you've been reading me, like some people have for like 10, 12 years, they might read something new I wrote and be like, I don't know about that. But I know Tressie thinks that through. I know she does X and I know she does Y. So I'm going to hang out for a minute and see what happens. That you have to build that every single time you go up to bat. And I do it no matter what the platform is. I treat writing for like a digital publication with low circulation the exact same way I treat writing for the New York Times that's gonna reach a few million people all over the world. I treat them exactly the same. My standards are high across the board because the reader's following me and, um, and that matters. So building an audience is about trust, it's about giving people an experience so that they trust you um, when you press them and when you push them into a hard, new and exciting place. Um, and then the part that I think is really hard if you got too much ego in it, is that when people discover and they do finally buy your argument, right? They're like, okay, I get that. That's changed the way I think. I have to give the credit to them and not to me. The thing I think my audience comes back for is that they feel good about themselves when they figure it out. It doesn't matter that I guided them, right? It doesn't matter that I set up the roadmap and <laughs> the guardrails. At the end of it, when they think, I did that, I did that hard work, I have to go, yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> but that's why I think people keep coming back. Yeah. You know, the audiences I think about, I think about those people who have been following the Grateful Dead around for 30 years. I think about the people I've been watching this documentary about Star Trek, because I love Star Trek, and they talk about how that fandom kept that show alive as it moved from property to property and people didn't want to invest in it. Like if you want that kind of like deep sustained uh, community of people who will hold you down and lift you up, like that ain't shallow. That, that's not Instagram follows, I'm sorry. That's people invested in you and your art and whatever you make. And for that, I don't think you can start with a brand. I think you have to start with the feeling of what you want to create for people and over time, it can become, you can negotiate what that brand is with the audience, 
but like you just dropping top down a brand on the people um can like be successful i think in the short term and a very limited definition of success but the kind of success i'm talking about is the success that you know shows up when willie nelson went broke and the irs took all his money and so all of his fans showed up at the auction of his stuff that the irs was doing and they bought his stuff back for him and gave it back to him doing that with you think your people on instagram gonna hold you down when the irs takes your money like i'm you know i mean i'm talking about like an investment in your art because they think it matters to their lives and to the world and i don't think brands generate that brands make people buy brands don't make people sacrifice real fans sacrifice for you their time their energy sometimes their reputation they hold you down when it's not convenient um and i don't think brands generate that authentic feeling and emotion is what people remember nobody goes to sleep at night humming the tied theme song you know people go to sleep at night humming anita baker and anita baker ain't been able to stream you ain't heard anita baker stream in 10 years because they had legal disputes and you still singing anita baker and to yourself in the middle of the night tide commercials been on your tv all day long ain't nobody singing tide commercials to themselves you singing anita baker that's different that's authenticity yeah, that ain't a brand. It is hard for me to explain to people what my business is. Um, you know, on paper, what I effectively have built and run is a micro publishing company um, where I am the primary uh, creative talent. Um, but in all of my like institutional partnerships, no matter who I am working with, even before I quite understood my business to be that a micro publishing company, I understood that what my real business in life is, like what my strategy in life is, is to do me. It is to do Tressy. It is to build Tressy, whatever that means and whatever that is. Um, and so whether it is like, you know, my day job at an academic institution, whether it's with the New York Times, whether it's with Medium, uh, whether it's with Luminary, all these people that I have partnered with over the years, what I'm always trying to figure out in those partnerships is not how I can come in and be a part of that institution and make that institution better and save it from itself. I come into every partnership saying, what about this institution is going to make Tressy better? What's going to help me do Tressy? What can I take from this exchange that is going to build this thing? And that's been my perspective even before um, like I was doing really big deals. I mean, even when I was like in graduate school and I'm working on becoming a professor and when it's really uncertain that that's even going to work out for me, you know, one way or the other, um, I just always had in mind that what I was really here to do was this other thing. And that goes back to like feeling that clock and that creative urgency and a sense of purpose. Um, and if you got a sense of purpose, Institutions can't buy and sell you. They cannot buy and sell you. I lease my services to my employers and partners. I do not sell them, right? I always own the core product and that's me, my vision and my creative energies. Um, and that's how I enter into every partnership. I didn't build a business infrastructure for what I was doing soon enough mostly because no one told me I was running a business. Like, believe it or not, I mean, I was running a business for like four years before it occurred to me um, that I was like a successful business at that, that I was like generating revenue. Um, and again, kind of goes back to something I said earlier where I, I, have this, I had this weakness of waiting for somebody else to validate what I was doing. And because no one I respected said to me, hey, you realize you're like, you like built a small publishing company and you should treat it that way and you should get a freaking CPA and you should get <laughs> an accountant and a lawyer and you should get an assistant and you should get help and you should do marketing. You should treat that seriously because um, all of that felt like a side hustle, right? It felt like something you were doing on the side. Um, and so I didn't build out that infrastructure and mostly built the plane while I was flying it. Um, and it cost me a ton of time and money. Let me tell you, you don't ever want to fuck with. You fuck with the mob before you fuck with the IRS. 
right? Like everybody's always like, oh, you need to get your street, your stuff straight, get you a lawyer. I, no, get you an accountant, boo boo. Get you an accountant. You get the lawyer after you get the accountant. Like I wish I'd have had like a real serious business manager CPA um, far sooner, even before like my revenue seemed to justify it. Because some of the problem is you're leaving money on the table because you aren't forecasting properly what you need to make to make the whole thing work. And that's what a good CPA um, can do for you. Um, and so I didn't do that uh, soon enough. In fact, I really just got that infrastructure up and running and sophisticated enough for my business in like the last year. And let me tell you, I've been working hard for a lot longer than the last year. I should have had this set up like eight, nine years ago. Huge mistake, get a CPA, get a lawyer down the line, get a CPA first, a good one. There's absolutely such a thing as owning your master's as a writer. Um, it's not structured the same legally, so we don't sometimes talk about it the same. Um, but a very good friend of mine and one of my favorite uh, contemporary writers, Kieze uh, Lehman, uh, I recently interviewed him um, for this podcast. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to him on that show was because he had done something really dope. He had bought back his first two books. Um, that sold, published, you know, it done well. It set him up to become the writer that he is now. He's acclaimed and, you know, he's got the, the cushy job at a school, you know, all that comes with that um, writing success. But he brought those two books back to revise and reissue them. And he structured that as part of his new writing deal. And it was um, kind of novel, but not totally unheard of, um, you know, one of the things that writers have to think about is how long a publisher gets to own the rights to your creative work. Um, and we don't always negotiate those things, especially when we are new writers. Um, so there is such a thing as like when my book is out of print, if it's out of print, meaning the publisher has stopped publishing it um, uh, or they're publishing it only on demand, meaning when somebody orders it, which is how they do now, um, how some publishers now do because you can print on demand. Um, pretty quickly and efficiently. Um, but like in my later book contracts, as opposed to my early ones, like I pay attention to things like how, how long do you own those rights? Um, because if you're not selling it to people anymore, meaning you're not promoting it and it's not in your catalog and you're not taking it out, um, to book retailers, then you should give it back to me. Cause hell, I can print on demand myself, right? Like, you know, so you, you should give it back to me and let me figure out what I want to do with the work. Um, so there's absolutely such a thing as owning your master's. Publishers increasingly, even like mainstream, you know, legitimate, big, prestigious ones, um, don't just want to own the 1500 word piece they commissioned you to write. They want to own the derivatives to anything that will come out of it. You know, I call it the Disneyfication of writing where we're not writers anymore. We're content makers. And so they want to own the very idea, meaning the intellectual energy of creating the creative project. So they don't want to commission the 1500 words that they might have paid you $500 for. They want to give you $550 and own the essay and anything that might be created based on that essay, to which I encourage everybody to say, fuck you. Um, you are not, <laughs> you are not Star Wars, okay? Uh, the idea that, um, yeah, I could talk about this a lot and I get really emotional about it because the idea that what a creative person does can be structured like any other commodity um, really gets at the heart of what a creative person is. And I think we understand that better um, with musicians and performers than we do with writers. But arguably, in an internet-based world, the two most powerful creative forces are the visual artist and the writer. That's literally what the internet is built on, images and words, that's it. And in that reality, in that structure, the writer should be king, right? The writer should be king. And instead, what, what like really powerful media companies have done is they have devalued and demoted the writer to content producer, right? And I tell people, I don't make content, I write. So you're gonna deal with me as a writer because writer has in it some sense of ownership over my work and my ideas. Um, and the fight has moved from like the right to own the, um, uh, the essay or the book that I write for you to the domain of fighting for your derivatives.